Hi, so today we're going to wrap up our discussion of classification and we're going to talk about how you can solve classification problems where you have more than one class. And so uh, just to give you a bit of a roadmap, what we're going to talk about is the distinction between binary classification and binary classifiers versus multi-class classification and multi-class classifiers. And then we'll talk about three different techniques, how you can take binary classifiers and turn them into multi-class classifiers. So in some cases, your problems are naturally binary. So either an email is spam or it isn't. Uh, either you're still talking about the same topic or you're not. Uh, or if there are two entities that you see in a document, either they're referring to the same thing or not, i.e. does he refer to President Obama or not. So those are naturally binary problems and you can use a lot of classifiers to solve those problems. But many other problems are inherently multi-class. So uh, taking a bunch of documents and seeing what is this document about? Is it about uh, baseball, hockey, or soccer? Uh, we also looked a little bit at part of speech tagging. That's another inherently multi-class problem. Is this word a noun, a verb, an adjective, or whatever else? Or if you have an image and you're looking at different aspects of the image, is this a car, is this the sky, is this a tree? That can also be considered a multi-class classification problem. And so we want to have powerful machine learning techniques that can handle those problems. And so many of the machine learning techniques that we've talked about, naive Bayes, logistic regression, uh, k-nearest neighbors, those are inherently multi-class. It's easy to form your classification problem as a multi-class classification problem with these algorithms. But other classifiers that we've talked about uh, that are very powerful and have good theoretical properties are inherently uh, binary. So support vector machines, perceptron, boosting, these are all inherently binary classifiers. So uh, let's take a look at how we can handle multi-class data. Uh, and here's an example of some multi-class data. We have some feature vectors that represent uh, various uh, children and we want to figure out what their favorite color is. And there are a number of different colors, uh, uh, yellow, red, blue, green. Uh, these are uh, more than two classes, so this is a multi-class problem. And we want to solve this uh, classification problem with only a binary classifier. Uh, we have examples that come in that are uh, positive or negative. They go into our classifier. Out, uh, our algorithm out comes some hypothesis, and this hypothesis will be plus or minus given any observation x that we see. So how do we use a classifier like this to do multi-class classification and thus get a multi-class classifier? Okay, so let's start off with something that we've talked a little bit about before, uh, one against all classification. And this is such an old and obvious idea um, that it's sort of part of machine learning folklore. And so here, uh, you have k classes, and for each of your k classes, you train a classifier. So you have a classifier for green, uh, you have a classifier for yellow, you have a classifier for red, and you have a classifier for blue. Uh, and each of these classifiers uh, looks at all of your data and decides uh, for each point, is this a green point or not? So in our training set, only X5 is green. And so uh, your classifier would only say uh, X5 is a positive example. Uh, for the yellow class, only X1 and X4 are positive. Uh, for the red class, only X2 is positive. And for the blue class, only X3 is positive. So this is how you create uh, this synthetic training set for each of these f four classifiers. And then given those four classifiers that you've trained, you can now apply them at, te at test time. And so how do you do that? Uh, you basically have, for every new piece of data that comes in, you run each of your uh, four classifiers, or K classifiers, depending on the number of classes that you have. 
and you hope that one is exactly right. Uh, if uh, more than one says yes, uh, then that means you're not quite sure what class it belongs to. You can take the one with highest confidence. Um, but the, the bad news is that you can get an incorrect classification if even one of these classifiers that you've trained on each of your classes comes up with a wrong prediction. So an alternative to one against all uh, is all pairs uh, classification. And uh, uh, in the book, this is also uh, called one versus one classification, so one class versus one class. Um, all pairs is um, a little bit more common uh, from what I've seen, but both names are used. Okay, so uh, what's happening here is that instead of having one classifier uh, for each of your K classes, you now consider all pairs. And so there are on order K squared pairs of classes. And so uh, we're going to train a classifier for each of them. And so we'll have a green versus a yellow classifier. And so whenever there is a green or a yellow, we're going to create uh, a subset of our data to create a training set for this first classifier. So yellows will be negative, greens will be positive. And we do that for all of our pairs. And so one thing that you'll notice about this is that uh, the training sets for each of the individual classifiers are smaller. And so even though there are more classifiers, assuming that your classifiers take time linear in the number of examples to train, the overall training time might be a wash. And uh, then uh, at test time, uh, it's a little bit more principled because instead of just hoping that one of your classifiers returns uh, true and all of the others are false, uh, you can basically take a vote and take as your classification uh, the class that got the most votes uh, from all of these individual classifiers. And this turns out to be faster and more accurate uh, than one against all at train time. And uh, so digging into the comparisons a little bit more, at training time, uh, uh, one versus all, uh, you have to train M classifiers, uh, with some training time m to the alpha each. So that adds up multiplicatively. And then for all pairs, uh, you're dividing up your data uh, into k buckets. And so even though you have k squared, the, the k squared and the k uh, raised to the alpha cancel each other out. Uh, but then at test time, it becomes far more expensive. Uh, but that being said, all pairs uh, tends to get better performance. A third way of doing it, uh, of creating a multi-class classifier, is called error correcting output codes. And uh, this is sort of the gold standard today. There are more advanced versions, such as error correcting tournaments. Uh, but we'll just talk about error correcting output codes. So uh, this is uh, a little bit more complicated. In error correcting output codes, uh, what you do is uh, we're now going to create what's called a coding matrix. And the coding matrix uh, has a binary representation for each of your classes. And we're going to use some number of bits to form this. Uh, obviously, you'll need a logarithmic number of bits in, at minimum, but we'll use more bits uh, so that we can have an error correcting code, as you'll see in a second. So uh, let's take a look at green. So uh, this is um, analogous to 10101. And if we look at any other row in this coding matrix, you can see uh, that every uh, other row is at least two bits away from any other row. Uh, so uh, if you look at the yellow row, uh, we have a difference in this bit, and we have a difference in this bit. 
And in the red row, uh, we have a difference in this bit, and we have a difference in this bit. And then finally, in the last row, uh, we have a difference in this bit and this bit. And uh, this is where it gets its name. If there is one error in any of these bits, uh, you'll always go back to the correct class. Okay, so uh, that's sort of the theoretical uh, idea behind it. You have binary strings, they can get corrupted, and if it's only corrupted by one bit, uh, you'll do okay. And so uh, it's kind of obvious what you do next. You train a classifier for each bit uh, in the coding matrix. And so you have a classifier for the first bit, the second bit, the third bit, the fourth bit, the fifth bit. And in each case, uh, you train uh, your data on the true label, and that has some uh, code in the coding matrix. And then uh, for that classifier, you look at the appropriate bit, and then that becomes that entry. So for uh, yellow examples, the first bit is false. So that becomes your training example for the first bit on the first example. And you do that for all the bits, all the examples. And then at test time, you run each of these classifiers for each of your bits, and now you get a bit sequence. And then uh, you take the closest row of the coding matrix as your prediction. And uh, if there's only one mistake, you'll get it right. And you can make uh, your coding matrix as long as you want it to be to decrease the number of, uh, sorry, to increase the number of bits that you can uh, get wrong in your final classification. And this isn't a course on error correcting code, so we won't go into doing that, um, but uh, it can be done. And the nice thing about this is that if the rows of M are far apart and you can make them arbitrarily far apart as you want, uh, you'll be robust to error. And this can be much, much faster than the alternatives if k is large, uh, because you basically only need uh, a logarithmic number of bits uh, compared to the number of classes. But the disadvantage is that, is that these binary problems that you're training classifiers for may be unnatural. And maybe uh, the underlying classifiers won't be able to do a good job. And so, uh, that's uh, all of the three kinds of multi-class classification that I wanted to talk about. Uh, these are really important techniques, uh, and it's important for you to think about what's going on underneath the hood. Oftentimes, these things will be implemented for you by some machine learning package, and you'll be able to choose which one is happening. Uh, and you need to be able to choose the correct one when you have a multi-class classification problem. And sometimes one will make more sense than another. Uh, and, but using these powerful tools, you'll be able to implement many different forms of classification with many different objective functions, even if the underlying classifier is binary. And uh, in the book, they talk about some of the theoretical bounds uh, that you can get for these classification tasks. And this uh, serves as a bridge to the future. Uh, even though this is the last time that we'll be talking about classification today, uh, as we move forward, you'll see that many of the things that we talk about can be reduced to classification problems, often binary classification. And so you'll see that we spent all this time on classification, um, even though classification isn't uh, all there is in machine learning, oftentimes it's a bedrock of the more complicated algorithms um, that we use to do more complicated tasks. So uh, next time we'll be talking about ranking, and we'll see some more reductions to binary classification problems that can help us solve these more complicated tasks.